Mr. Chair. This evening I'd like us to pray for important items on the agenda and in the committee's minutes. I'd like us to pray for options facing the Council with regard to office transformation, with regard to forming and execution of the 2017-2018 budget and the proposed formation of new district wards. Lord God, we pray that you will guide and direct with your heavenly and peaceable wisdom our discussions in regard to major and significant matters which lie before us tonight and in the coming weeks. The many options before us regarding office transformation, all of which will have a major impact on the working of Council and the lives of our employees and the future of our communities. The formation and execution of the 2017-2018 budget with all the great pressures of reduced government support and the need to raise more funding from local people. The pro proposed formation of new wards in the district of Tendring, the potential reduction in numbers of councillors and considerable changes in the mode of operation of many wards. We pray that in these very considerable matters we may bear in mind not only our own interests and concerns but also and primarily the interests and concerns and well-being of our communities and constituents. May we always bear in mind our district motto for the good of all. May all that we discuss and decide tonight be discussed and decided for the well-being of our people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We pray for any in our council, any employees of our council, and any members of our families who are in need of your presence, your help, or your healing touch. May they, in their hour of need, draw close to you, and may you draw close to them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. Following the sad news of the passing of Councillor John Hughes at the weekend, I would ask that you all join with me in a minute's silence for John. Thank you. Please be seated. John Hughes has been a committed and dedicated servant of Tendring District Council for the past 20 years. He represented St James Ward in Clacton from 1997 to 2003, Alton Park Ward from 2007 to 2011 and St James Ward for the second time from 2015 until his death. He was a portfolio holder for the Benefits and Revenues section on three occasions and the Corporate Service, Services Portfolio Holder from 2016 onwards. John was also a long-serving council-appointed trustee for the John Gilders and Maskell Almshouses Charity. Outside of the council, John spent a number of years as a governor at Alton Park Junior School, Clacton, and for much of that time held the position of vice-chairman. I'm sure that the Council will join me in sending condolences and best wishes to John's family. Councillor Stock. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, I'd just like to um, thank you for that um, little bit of history about John. Uh, he was a real character, was John Hughes. I think that would be fair to say. I think he would describe himself as being a bit of a rascal. Um, he certainly brought a lot of colour to this council chamber and certainly to the Cabinet. He was on the Cabinet of this council before I was even elected. I think he was one of the very first uh, Cabinet members when the Cabinet was formed way back in 2001. <coughs> um, and he came and went. He lost his seat. He came back on again. Different political colours. Um, but he's been a big part of this council for 20 years and he's going to be greatly missed. And Madam Chairman, I didn't appreciate the gentleman in the audience who's dressed like a womble um, coughing all the way through, deliberately coughing to interrupt a minute of silence. I think if we can't respect someone, the minute of silence when someone has died, I think it's a pretty poor state of affairs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Councillor Scott. Yeah, I'd like to um, echo Councillor Stock's comments about uh, the late uh, Councillor John Hughes. When I first got elected in 2002, um, I used to sit with uh, Councillor John Hughes on the committee, and he was very welcoming. He offered me advice, and he used to say, even though we were on different sides of the fence, we do have a chat and stuff. And uh, when I um, actually chaired the Community Leadership and Partnership Committee, um, I always brought sweets as chairman to the, the committee and then brought them round. And Councillor Hughes used to say, oh, chairman, your generosity is, 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 is outstanding. I, I do appreciate the sweets. And there were strawberry bonbons at the time. And Councillor John Hughes says, but chairman, um, I would appreciate you bring softer sweets because my dentures would not be able to cope with the strawberry bonbons. So from there on, from their subsequent meetings, I, I bought um, sweets which were softer so Councillor uh, Hughes could chew them throughout the meeting. He's going he's to be a big, big loss for this council. Um, he, he was a character, and he had a distinct personality, and, 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 um, and I believe he, he had a, from the Midlands regional accent. So, uh, yeah, his, his humour was, uh, was interesting. But um, my, my condolences go to uh, Councillor John Hughes' family. Thank you. Councillor Tolbert, but would you like to remain seated? Chairman will invite you to stay seated. I'd sooner have the sympathy and stand. <laughs> but no, when I joined the council in '99, John Hughes uh, was here. He was his title was Independent Conservative, but he was a member of a quite large independent group at that time. By 2003, the government had changed the rules and you could no longer use any word in front of that of a national party. So you couldn't say independent Labour, independent Conservative. He stood as an independent then and I believe he lost his seat. He did return later on as a Conservative member and latterly as a UKIP member. But all the time John has had a commitment to what he's been doing and he's always thoroughly enjoyed it. He did quite a lot of charitable work about the area. And I feel, although he hasn't been the same man for around about the last nine months or so, he will be greatly missed in the community, and we will miss him on the council. So um, uh, I sympathise entirely with his widow uh, at this moment in time. Thank you. Councillor Turner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. John Hughes, a civic life well led. We first met sometime in the late 90s. He was, with several others, was an independent conservative, which you could be in those far off days. He wasn't, one of, he wasn't with us, but he was one of us. He was independent, and that really summed John up. John was a Brummagen. My father was as well. They came from the second city, Birmingham, known for its nonconformist, back to the independent streak again, and believing in self-help, hard work, and thrift. This made us natural allies, Although never close, we often found that we reinforced each other's views, First, firstly on the licensing committee in the 1999-2003 council, then again in the first two years of the 2007-11 council. This made us natural... Uh, my, uh, council, sorry. my love of the Gunfleet Farm is well known. John, Councillor John White, and me were on the planning committee that was there to agree the path of the cable from the wind farm to the substation via a hole in the seawall at Holland Haven. I recollect that the three of us went into a huddle to see if we could get any planning gain. 
John was with me. John White was an interested bystander. I remember looking down at the cut, which was all of six foot wide and not very deep, and thinking, and looking at John, we cannot get anything out of this. His look echoed mine. It was a comic moment, but showed our joint commitment to tendering. In 2009, the Conservatives joined and joined the Conservative Party for the 2007 election, with the Community Representative Party took power. In this administration, John became portfolio holder for benefits and revenues, a position he regained as an independent for this council. He cared deeply about many things, not least the mentally ill. It was through his talking and understanding of mental illness that helped to focus the minds of Tendring's Shadow Health and Wellbeing Board in making the decision that mental illness should be its first priority. I shall miss his good words and common sense. John, rest in peace. Your race is run. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Also, uh, Councillor Ivan Henderson. Thank you, Chair. And I too would like to pass on um, my group's condolences to John's family and friends for he, their sad loss. Um, I first, possibly not as a councillor, but my first contact with John was probably when I was um, MP for Harridge and Clacton. He was on to me many a times, and for all good reason, it was always be putting his public duty first and with these charities um, in mind uh, every time asking for further and further support and more and more um, financial support that you could possibly get for them. I think it's always right, although when we leave this chamber we w possibly wa walk in different directions, we should always recognise and pay tribute to those who have been true public servants to their residents and to this district. Councillor Griffiths. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's very difficult to sum up somebody like John. It's been my privilege to know him for the last 20 years. It's been my privilege to work with him over that time, both within local authority and also with the governors at Alton Park School. He was a man who was always friendly, always charming, personally very helpful to me and, and, and family members who loved Clacton and who loved their home here of St James. It's been my privilege to know him and his family and it's been my privilege to, to be part of, of some of the things that he's been doing. Whilst we may not always have been on the same uh, sort of political party, John was always friendly, helpful and very supportive. A mark of the man was the fact that when I took over from him as St James councillor, in 2003, he did everything possible to help me as a new councillor. As he always said, my phone's always there, and if you ever need any advice, the door's always open. He was a man that I shall personally miss. He was a man who, who, who showed what it was to be a good councillor. He, he was a person of the community, and he was a person of this town. We shall miss him. I shall miss him. This council will miss him. My sympathies go to John's family. Rest in peace. A life well lived. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Chair. Unfortunately, I didn't have the luxury of many of the councillors here, and we didn't know John very long. And our condolences go out to Jane, his wife, his family and his friends. Thank you very much. Item two, apologies for absence. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have uh, apologies from Councillor Fairley, Councillor Callender, Councillor Ferguson, and Councillor Broderick. Item three, minutes. The council is asked to approve as a correct record the minutes of the council meeting held on Tuesday the 22nd of November and Tuesday the 29th of November. Councillor Buke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. 
page 11, fifth paragraph, when we had a motion to the Council proposed by Councillor Nichols, it says that uh, Councillor Nichols explained his motion and that Councillor Dubuque then spoke on the motion. Can I please have it noted that I spoke against the motion, not on it? Thank you, Chairman. Does every, everybody agree? Four, declarations of interest, just to remind councillors to declare any disclosure or pecuniary interests, either now or as we go along. Thank you. Five, announcements by the chairman of the council. Um, I just, sorry, no, I'm going to do that one in a minute. Um, I'd just like to remind members that the civic service is on Sunday at 2.30 at Trinity Church and thank the councillors and staff and officers who attended the quiz night last Friday where we raised £805.60. Well <clears throat> and I was really pleased I didn't come bottom. <laughs> Also, I'm sure the council would like to wish to join me in congratulate, congratulating Councillor Neil Stock, who received an OBE in the New Year's Honours List for services to local government. Congratulations. <laughs> Councillor Tolbert. If I may on that item, uh, Chairman, um, we have to bear in mind there's 30 members of this council who have no experience at all of Neil Stock, apart from seeing him from 2015 onwards as chairman of the council. I'd just like to make a few comments, not too seriously, about the situation. I first knew Neil when he came in after the 2003 elections on a set of crutches in plaster attending his first meeting at Wheelie. That was the first time I ever saw him. And then when the diary was published, alphabetically, he was one above me. So <laughs> that's two associations, if you like. Uh, the, f the fact is that um, he was just a member of the council and nothing more to most people. Then in 2009, May 2009, the administration of which I was a member lost control by one vote. And Neil Stock, then, was moved by a member of the Conservative Party to be leader of the, leader of the council. Uh, he was elected by one vote and appointed his cabinet. Uh, one of the things I must say is, I do not vote Conservative. So what I say in any way, I'm no sycophant of anybody. Uh, my view is always to support people who I think are doing the right thing. But in opposition, Neil Stock, and he was speaking for the opposition quite a number of times, always claimed that the opposition should have a bigger role in the council in running tendering. When he came to power, he began to put his money where his mouth was and extended to opposition group leaders features they'd never had before. At the very first cabinet meeting he ran, after being elected leader of the council, he gave a formal invitation to the leaders of all the opposition groups, not as many as we've got now, but the opposition groups, to attend the cabinet meeting, to take part in the discussion, to join in wherever they felt it necessary, to do everything virtually except to vote on any of the items. Now, that had never been done before. The administration of which I was a member would have... Um, stepped away from something like that. It was a man who said he felt in opposition, the opposition should have a role, and here he was actually giving that role um, to members. It was officially just an invitation to start with, but Ivan Henderson eventually picked up the fact that it was something that should be enshrined in the Constitution, and the Constitution now gives leaders of opposition parties the right to attend cabinet meetings, rather than just an invitation. The remains of the procedure today is there because of Neil's initial idea and Ivan's strengthening of it. 
In August 2010, all opposition group leaders were entitled were invited to join a committee to consider the appointment of a new chief executive. Uh, that was the first time anything quite like that had been done, if you go back to the appointment of the previous executive. Uh, that was a successful outcome, and as we know, uh, Ian, of course, was the, except, was the leader uh, accepted. Uh, notwithstanding only having a one-vote majority in council, he chose to pick a member of any other party other than a Conservative to be chairman of the scrutiny committee as it existed at the time. And Gary Scott at the back, in fact, was the man who the opposition groups together appointed. That was very risky with such a slender majority. Because he believed it so much, it was done. Notwithstanding uh, anything that's gone on, following the 2015 elections, Neil recognised the divisions, the way the electorate had divided the district. I think it was 23 Conservatives, 22 UKIP, and myself and the Labour Party and a number of other independents. But he did decide the way forward might be some sort of grand alliance where everybody worked together to run tendering. He invited all the groups to join him in a collective administration. Unfortunately, that didn't succeed. Some accepted and some didn't because they preferred to preserve their independence. Even at the Cabinet meeting last Friday, Neil invited the leaders that were present that if they had any points they wished to raise for the, the finance meeting, the budget meeting um, on the 7th, that if they put them forward in advance to him, he'd have them examined, costed, and if it was possible to incorporate them in the budget, he'd do so. So they had their own point. Yet another way of recognising the role of the opposition. Finally, Neil, when you come to leave tendering, as you will, we all do, you will leave behind a legacy. You will leave behind things here that have changed the way we work. And many of us would say, change them for the better. So all I can say is, we take what you've done for granted now because it's part of our procedures. But good luck, Neil, and congratulations on your award. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to make it quick. always hate following Michael. On behalf of myself and the UKIP group, I would also I'd like to congratulate the Leader of the Council, Neil Stock, on his award of Officer of the Order of the British Empire. It is a great honour to receive, and I wish you a glorious day at St Paul's Cathedral in May. As a side note, I have put in a word with the Central Chancery, and hopefully you'll be sat between Victoria Beckham and Jessica Ennis-Hill. <laughs> Yeah, with that in my mind. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and, and thank you for putting that word in, Mark. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you, Councillor Tolbert, for your um, very eloquent and thoughtful words. I was forgetting a lot of that stuff. I'd forgotten all about my leg being... Um, yeah, I had a nasty operation on my leg when I first became a councillor. <coughs> anyway, it was very effective. Um, yeah. Um, it, I know people always say this when they get an honour, such as I've just been fortunate enough to have bestowed upon me. Um, but it is incredibly humbling. And... You know, I can't help thinking that, you know, yeah, I'm delighted to have received this for myself and I'm the one who gets to take the, the gong home, sitting next to someone else at the palace. Um, but I do think that it is a reflection of the position that this council is now in, certainly within the county of Essex, if not much wider than that. We are now recognised as being an innovative, creative and a, and a, a leadership council. We'll take on challenges, we'll face them down, we'll do things a bit differently, but we'll get things done. I'm the one who's lucky enough to have been honoured uh, with, with the OBE, and obviously I'm, I'm very pleased about that, but it is a reflection of a lot of hard work and dedication by the superb officers we have at this council and the superb members we have on this council. And I know, you know, not all 60 members here support me by any stretch of the imagination, but I've said this, I'll, I'll take this council, this chamber, over most of the other ones in Essex any day of the week. Um, we have our disagreements, but I think we, we do try and work for the constructive good of the district as a whole, and I think um, <clears throat> that's the great strength of this council at the moment. We are going in the right direction, and I'm, I'm really proud and pleased to, to be leader of this council and to receive this honour. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Number six, announcements by the Chief Executive. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Madam Chairman, since the publication of the Council book, I can formally report that on 19th of January 2017, and pursuant to Regulation 9B of the Local Government Committee, Committees and Political Groups Regulations 1990, Councillors John Chittock and Poonian and Mick Skills Jr. each served for formal notice on the Council that they wished to be treated as members of the Conservative political group. Those notices were countersigned by the leader of the Conservative group, Councillor Stock. As Regulation 8, little 1, of the aforementioned regulations require a political group to have a minimum of two members, this means that the Tendering Independence Group and the Coastal Independence Group have ceased to exist as mandated in Regulation 8, little 2. Uh, and also, ma Madam um, Chairman, as, as it, with, sincere, with, sorry, with sincere regret, as has been previously mentioned, I do formally report the death of Councillor John Hughes, and details of the funeral arrangements, arrangements will be notified to members in due course. The notice of the vacancy in St James Ward will also be given in due course. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Item 7, statements by the Leader of the Council. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I did mention at Cabinet on Friday, for those who were present, um, that I was going to make a statement today um, about the, uh, the flooding or the near flooding incident that we had take place in this district and, and actually beyond on the east coast of England going back, what was it, nearly two weeks ago. I would like to uh, thank and pay tribute to the, the dedicated and hard-working staff of this council and our multi-agency partners working with them who put in um, place a system uh, to basically evacuate people, to protect people, had the worst, had that catastrophic event that so nearly happened, had that actually taken place. Now, there but for the grace of God, it didn't go, it didn't go all horribly wrong, but we know in this district that it can, and that at some point in the future it will. Uh, memories of the 1953 flood still around in this district, indeed. Um, you've only got to speak to, to John White on his memories of it. Um, <clears throat> and we don't want a repeat of the fatalities that we had back in 1953. So I, really, I know that there are people who say, oh, we got evacuated and it didn't come over, therefore we shouldn't have been evacuated. And of course that isn't the case at all. It could so easily have been different if the wind had just changed a little bit differently, any tiny little change in the weather patterns, and there could have been a catastrophic flooding event. And it wasn't just Jaywick, there were all other parts of the district, even people in Missley. Uh, there's lots of low-lying places that are prone to flooding across this district, and it's essential that we have uh, these measures in place and that we have that emergency response team uh, that did such an effective job. And as I say, tribute to our staff. And I know I'd also like to thank many of the members of this council who, off their own backs, wrote in, sent emails in, made phone calls to congratulate and thank staff, and I think it's really appreciated uh, by many of the officers here um, and, and in the multi-agency partnerships uh, in, in those teams that were all helping to, to coordinate that effort. So a lot of work went into that. I'm sure there's lessons we can learn. I'm sure there are things that can be improved, and I think we need to treat it as a dry run in a very literal sense of the word. Excuse the pun. I didn't intend that one. Um, but, you know, taking the positives out of this, nobody got injured, nobody got hurt. We went through the process and it worked. It was effective. So well done, everyone. Councillor Culver, but would you like to remain seated? Yeah. Uh, very quickly, Chair, if I may, on behalf of the Labour Group, may I simply endorse everything that the Leader of the Council has just said and also add that I think all members very much appreciated the level of communication that was given to all members. We were kept advised at all times in circumstances that can't always have been easy to achieve. And that was very much appreciated. And as I say, we would like to endorse everything the leaders just said. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor White. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I also would like to congratulate the emergency response team for what they did. Um, and it was, thank heavens, the wind changed both direction and strength two hours before. Uh, the anticipated tide. However, I did wish to query um, who specifies the need for evacuation? I have been told that it's the Environment Agency jointly with the police that actually dictate this. Um, I was then told that they only specify Jay Wick, and this is done by 
issuing the postcodes of the people in Jaywick. Um, I, I'd like to uh, this council to remind the EA that nowadays there are over 200 people living at St Joseph Beach at exactly the same flood level as there was, uh, or as there is, in Grasslands and Brooklands Jaywick. Uh, no warnings, however, were issued to them. And I would like again to remind the EA that it was in the 1953 floods um, that the sea walls broke in so, no fewer than 12 different places in St. Joseph, and that allowed the flood water to drown the 35 persons in Jay Wick. At that time, we were waiting for the sea wall to be overtopped. It wasn't. The water came from round the back in exactly the, um, that area. So would the uh, leader agree with me that it is an important point to bring to the attention of the Environment Agency? Um, and there further are other points in and around Point Clear Bay as well, but it, it principally that worries me is the low level uh, flood level in the St. Joseph Beach area. Councillor Yallop. I would like to give my congratulations to DDC for their hard work and the updates which helped all agencies to work in conjunction with each other. But I would like to remind Council that four years ago, Brightling Sea was hit more severely than Jaywick. We had no calls this time to evacuate and our one and only fire engine was taken from the town to go to Mersey. It must be said that the Brightling Sea Town Council staff went over and beyond their call of duty. The businesses and the sailing clubs with the Town Council had all areas covered. Would the leader agree that this matter needs to be looked at? Thank you. Councillor Turner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> well, firstly, I'd also like to thank the Council and the Council staff for another excellent, well, wonderful display of unity and, uh, and looking after the residents of Tendering. I know from my own officers in my own services that uh, a lot of them attend and they tell me what goes on and how wonderful it's been organised. We also made allowances for pets this time, which was one of the major problems in Jaywick in the last surge. So that, and I must thank the dog wardens in particular for that. They've done yeah. a superb job. Now, as to the EA, I'm, I'm very pleased, secondly, I'm very pleased on the new defences we've got in here in Holland-on-Sea and Clacton. They had their first real test and they stood up to it magnificently. And um, so much so now that the sand is now level with the promenade down there. Uh, um, so that's one, that's a very good point all along there, but I have always been worried about Jaywick. I have taken the EA down there, I've been with them, I had meetings with them down there. I find... I wasn't going to say, but I'm going to say this. I find the fact that the EA consider evacuation is a good form of flood defence abhorrent. And I will be working, I have been working before and I will be working again. So what I would like to say to both uh, Councillor White and to Councillor Yallop, that I will be, I'm at a meeting at County on Thursday on flood, Essex Flood Committee, and I will be speaking quietly. Hopefully one of the senior members of the EA will be there. If not, I will deal with them and I will be asking them to uh, speak and invite them down so you can both, both discuss your, your concerns with them. Um, so uh, we've got a lot of our coastline sorted, but we've still got a few bits and pieces to do. And thank you, Lord, for being kind to us. Councillor Watley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, um, it's pretty much all been said, but I'd just like to congratulate the staff again. Um, and uh, uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, it, we learn every time we do this, and uh, Councillor Turner just mentioned the fact that animals were taken care of. Not only were animals taken care of, there were two different rooms, one for vaccinated dogs and one for non-vaccinated dogs. So everybody was taken care of. It's, it's brilliant, the organisation that goes into it. Um, but it's worth reiterating what our leader said uh, just a little while ago. I spoke to uh, Chief Inspector Russ Cole, the district, commander uh, of the area on the day and afterwards and um, it's not if we get a flood it's when we get a flood and this message has got to be got out there again and again 
Because we got away with it this time, because the wind didn't veer, as was said just a couple of hours before, it didn't overtop. And because some people stayed in their homes and they said it wasn't going to flood, and they were quite right. On this occasion, it didn't flood. But it will happen. And if you're given an evacuation order, please, please, please do it. Get out. Your life is far more important than anything else because it will happen. And I think that's a message that we've just got to say again and again. People will relax now and, say, and, and, and it's a bit like crying wolf. Well, no, it's not. This is very serious indeed and we must take it seriously. Thank you. Councillor Raby. Yes, Madam Chairman, I'd like to... What, what uh, Councillor Stock has just said, as a member of the JWIC and my colleague here, I'd like to thank the officers and staff that carried out their duties on that night. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't leave my home for one reason. Um, I went there down the seafront at 12 o'clock and the tide hadn't come in at that tidal surge. But I wasn't going to take any chances. I've got a... Uh, my, my lady friend's got a, a son who lives in, in Jaywick in the Close. He lives in the flat, top flat, in number 5A, the Close. And I spent the evening there till the following morning in which I went back. I took my little dog up there as well. Um, may I say, I mean, let's face it, we shouldn't be taking chances at the end of the day because we should take notice of the police and we should take notice of the authorities. I was kept informed all evening. Um, even the chief executive rang me. And, uh, yes, we were kept informed. Now, don't forget, we are still in Zone 3 in Jaywick at the end of the day, and we will be kept there by the Environmental Agency for a very long time. And, to be honest, I looked at the photographs of that East Coast this week, and I've got friends who live in Cromer, and you won't exceed the extent of the damage it done that night in Cromer. It was unbelievable. The pier was torn up. It was devastation up there at the moment. They've got a big clean-up campaign down there at the end of the day. So we can think ourselves lucky that nothing did happen. But don't take everything for granted, because it can happen, believe me. We could get another surge like they did in 1953. And as John White has just said, Councillor White has just said, those sea walls broke, and that, on that night it came round the back way. That's where all that lot was damage that was done. OK. I know we've put the flood defences in in Jaywick, OK, and it's probably helped at the end of the day, and Councillor Turner will agree with you on this, but at the end of the day, we just cannot take chances. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Councillor Coley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, again, I'd like to um, express my congratulations and thanks to the, all the officers and the emergency planning partners who, who took part in this fantastic, fantastic exercise. And that's how we must treat it. It was an exercise for the inevitable because it will happen one day. As um, my colleague says, it's not if, it, it will happen. So we planned well and, and I think we were fortunate. My question to, to the leader is, um, do we know how much this cost? We were very, very fortunate. Our rest centre was in operation for a fairly short period of time. But this authority has a legal and financial responsibility to care for those who are homeless. We were fortunate on this occasion it was just a few hours. It could have been a few days or a few weeks. Are we, are we confident that we could financially uh, meet that uh, challenge if it were to come? And we always have enough money ring fenced within our reserves to meet those uh, emergencies should they arise. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Chair. Once again, I find myself very, very proud to be part of Tenerife District Council. I think the, the evacuation um, and the subsequent management was exemplary. Um, and what I'd like to point out is that we heard things like Gold Command, and that was the senior management, but I'd also like to pay tribute to Silver Command, which I didn't know existed. Um, these are people like Richard Barrett, Mike Caron and Andy White, not to name a few. These are the people who manage the hour-by-hour -hour decisions. And then there's a Bronze Command. And these are the doers, such as Tim Sutton, Steve Goh and others. And all of these people, they did it as volunteers. And I'd like to show my appreciation for that. There was over 500 people 
that helped make this happen. And I'd also like to point out that the army and the police both praised TDC for their response and how they handled it. And I'd also like to point out that there is a very real risk of this happening again. It's not a matter of if, as like everybody else has said, it's a matter of when. There are other volunteers, the organisations, the CVST, and a few others that are, are too long to mention. But the most thanks I'd like to also give for, for the whole of Tenry is those that were prepared to put their own lives at risk should the inevitable happen. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Well, thank you, members, for the positive way in which you've responded to, to that statement. I won't go through everyone's um, comments, if I, if I may, but I'll start with, with Councillor Calver, uh, who brought up what I'd forgotten to mention, actually, which is one of the things that I agree with you, Gary, was absolutely uh, really, really impressive, by the way, was the communication from, from, from Ian, in particular, to us as members. Uh, the communication, it's all about communication. When, when there's a crisis taking place like that, um, <clears throat> was it the first casualty of war is the truth and if we're not careful we don't know what's going on and people start to panic and worry communication was superb and really really so important um, Councillor White um, who um, I remember when I first got elected back in 2003 as, as Michael Talbot already embarrassingly reminded us asking John White why he was always banging on about flood risk when we were, ever, we were talking about a planning application just about anywhere in the district and I kind of regretted asking him that question when he replied to me and said, Neil, if you, like me, have been a 14-year-old lad the day after the flooding in 1953, out in a rowing boat pulling bodies out of the water, you'd go on about the flooding too. And I've, uh, I've never forgotten those words, John. Very, very powerful. John's been there and seen it, literally. You know, 53 may seem like a lifetime ago, but, you know, we've got members who remember it vividly. He was there. And I will take up the point you, you made, John. Um, Councillor Yallop made a point about Brighton Sea, and it's a, re it's a really good point. And yet another coastal community that we have that faces the risk of the threat of flooding. They coped remarkably well on their own, but were they overlooked? We need to look into that. Um, Councillor Turner, Councillor Watling, um, I won't bother commenting on your comments with the greatest respect to you. Um, Councillor Raby, um, at the end of the day, you, you live through it yourself, so you know what it's like. Um, um, and I thank you for, for, your, for your comments. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I shouldn't say. Um, Councillor Coney made a really good point about the cost. And it's not even necessarily the operational cost of what it cost us to do what we did the other day. The potential cost to this council of having to house possibly hundreds, even thousands of people whose houses could have been washed out to sea. I mean, you know, God forbid it happens, but when it happens, and we've all said it will happen one day, hopefully we'll have evacuated everyone in advance so no one will actually lose their lives. That's hopefully what will happen. But there will be devastation to houses as there was in 1953. And we as the Housing Authority will have the responsibility for putting those people up in hotels, temporary accommodation, bed and breakfast or whatever. And the cost of that is going to be monumental. And I was looking through the budget we took to Cabinet the other day and one of the responsibilities of the Section 151 officer, our finance officer Richard Bauer, to make sure that we set a legal budget is to make sure we have adequate reserves to deal with um, such potential calamities. And that's exactly the kind of risk we have in this district, district. and it isn't just Jaywick. I know Jaywick got hit hardest in 53, but Harwich had uh, severe flooding in 53, Manningshire had severe flooding, Brighton, see all around the patch there was severe flooding and loss of life. Um, it was quite a catastrophe. We need to make sure we've got adequate reserves. And I don't know what the figure is in answer to Alan's question, but it's very, very high undoubtedly, and I think we should look into that. And Mark um, made a point of congratulating all the different officers and the teams and the various levels of command. And he's absolutely right, because what is critical, the police had overall gold command. And what's absolutely important is that we don't get people wandering around thinking they're more important than someone from a different agency. That hierarchy, that authority has to work by the person who's at the top in charge, taking decisions of past, trickling them down through all the different chains of command. And it did. It worked really, really brilliantly. Um, and that's a tribute to, to the police to the senior officers at Tendering, to the middle ranking, lower ranking, to all the officers at Tendering and all the other agencies. Mark mentioned many of them. Um, it really is a great team effort and um, everyone should be really proud of anything to do with that. So thank you uh, to the staff and officers here at Tendering and thank you guys for, for the way you've um, supported it. Well, thanks very much.
Number eight, statements by members of the Cabinet. Well done. Number nine, petitions to Council. Can I ask Mrs White if she'd like to come to the front? Thank you. I'm asking the Council to consider putting some sort of protection barriers on the field between Woodrow's Lane, Purley Way and Mayford Way. At the moment, the field is open to anyone with a motorised vehicle and the community are concerned that this leaves it open to anyone with a caravan or camper van bumping up a very small kerb and setting up camp. There are no signs at present stating no overnight camping or no unlawful motorised vehicles as a deterrent. And if we had bollards or a wooden fence, then this would protect our area. We appreciate that there should be a small opening at each end for council vehicles to be allowed access and for motability scooters and prams to be allowed through, but not big enough for caravans and motorhomes. My petition gained nearly 400 signatures just from my local area alone. There are a lot of elderly people who are concerned that our field being left open would leave them vulnerable and they would not feel safe to walk their dogs or walk alone to the shops while caravans and motorhomes were there. For the sake of a few bollards or small fence posts, this would put people's minds at rest. We have already had quad bikes and cars on the field, and this is a danger to young children as well. All other open areas seem to have some sort of protection apart from ours. My thanks to Andrew Pemberton for his help as well, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Councillor Pemberton. Um, um, I, I totally agree with what Trace is saying at this point. Uh, I do think we need some sort of signage to say uh, that no caravans or things on here. Um, look, there is money there. I'm sure we could use some of the money from the new homes budget. Um, I thought you were going to say that. Or like Mr Talbot said, you know, if, if we could incorporate something into the budget for this term, you know, it might be a good idea. Thank you. Councillor Honeywood. Thank you, Chairman. I agree with some of the parts in this report, but, dis but disagree with others. The report says that the introduction of physical barriers would be expensive and intro and to introduce and ma maintain. I agree. The report says that the Council is aware of similar concerns being raised elsewhere. I agree. The report says that if unauthorised access is desired by any group, they generally have means to remove any physical barriers. I agree. Constructing and maintaining defences is not the answer. The report says that there is an effective and generally conclusive procedure which has brought such incursions to relatively quick conclusion. This is where I disagree. All encampments are dealt with using legal powers and in accordance with government guidance, a process that I believe is costly and lengthy. The Council has to deal with any waste or fly tipping that is left behind. Where there is enough evidence to do so, we will seek to prosecute for fly tipping offences. However, this is not as straightforward as it could be. What is needed to make dealing with unauthorised encampments easier for this Council is a change in the law. Therefore, I propose an amendment, sorry, a, um, a motion. This Council asks the Leader of the Council to write to the Member of Parliament for Clapton, asking him to use his position in Parliament to seek to bring forward measures to make it quicker and easier for local authorities to deal with unauthorised encampments. Thank you, Chairman. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Griffiths. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to second the motion. Um, my home, St James Ward, as you're probably aware, 
has on it the Martello Coach Park and parts of West Greenswald. We have lots of signage, we have lots of wooden bollards and we still have a few illegal encampments. The problem isn't the signage or the bylaws which we've got in force, but the time it takes to move people off of it. My, I, I too have lots of elderly residents on the Spinnaker Close, which actually is adjacent to the Martello Bay Coach Park, and I'm sick and tired of my residents being kept awake at night by people with their, camp, with their camper van generators, with their dogs, with their noise, with their general inconsiderate behaviour along the whole of the West Seafront, sometimes for days at a time. What's needed actually isn't more bylaws or more posts, but Westminster to do something and our MP to act on it with, with, with stronger legislation from above. You know, I, I mean, lots of sympathy with, with, with uh, Councillor Pendleton and his residents, but unfortunately signage isn't the answer. What's needed is stronger legislation, and on that basis, I support Councillor Honeywood's motion. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. I'm Ward Councillor for Wheelie and Little Clacton, and over the last few years we have suffered many incursions from our travelling visitors. Um, they have broken to the playing fields. They have done if I may, Chairman, can I just st stop you there, just to be clear that you're talking around in terms of all incursions are come from any... Any groups. Any groups, thank you. Yeah. The, um, the damage they've done, they, we had approximately 45 trees in our local, local park. Two-thirds of them were ruined. They left filth and rubbish. They cut through a fence with a big chain as thick as my thumb. We replaced it, we blocked up one entrance, and we paid out £3,000 to have a caravan barrier put in. The following year, they climbed up and they cut that. The point that I'm making is that to make a small area really safe will cost a fortune. And I endorse exactly what has been said. It needs to come from above and new laws and new repercussions. Thank you. Councillor Heaney. Would it help if you stay seated? Or? Thank you very much. I will stay seated. Um, I had, um, we had, first of all, we had some incursions near us. Of, and first of all, they put up wooden um, sleep, railway sleepers. They, they were chainsawed off. Then we had concrete bollards, which they were looped round with um, wire and attached to the back of vehicles vans, I presume, and they were just pulled out of the ground. And it is nearly impossible to prevent people getting on to these sites if they want to. And I, in uh, hearing about um, Councillor Brown's, what happened in Wheelie, you know, you realise it's impossible. Thank you very much. Councillor Bray. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm happy to support this motion, very happy to. Uh, I do agree that something needs to happen in Westminster. But there is one other issue, and we've all sort of raised it and, and sort of floated over it. It is the case that uh, travellers are breaking in to areas to camp, and yet it seems that there is never any action taken against them for that. They're, they're chainsawing through wood, yes, they are. They're cutting through chains, yes, they are. This is criminal damage. And if I committed those acts, I would expect to be arrested and dealt with. Yet that never seems to happen with these people. And I wonder, given as we know that Westminster are possibly not the fastest route to getting anything done, if we could not ask our local law enforcement if they cannot take that a little bit more seriously. Certainly in Wheelie, as, as Councillor Brown has pointed out, they cut their way in. They did so again in Little Clacton and in actual fact were caught on CCTV doing so. And still nothing was done from a prosecution point of view. That cannot be right. The, the issue we have here is very many of the travellers, as we know, come from Ireland because the laws have been made harder there. Um, Hang on. No, sorry, it's nothing to do with where they come from, but the laws have been made harder there, which means that our laws are a, a little bit softer. And that, that could be a problem or it could be an issue. What is an issue is that criminal damage is being committed and I think we need to take that more seriously, wherever they're coming from, quite frankly. 
Thank you. Councillor Talbot. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to make a comment. We recently, all the summer, it seems, we've been, been getting copies of correspondence where Paul and his team have been dealing with incursions of one sort or another uh, of people on land where they shouldn't be. Uh, the motion that's been moved is absolutely well overdue. We had, in Point Clear Bay where I am, but I had advice from Brightlingsea that ones that had been occupying land, caravans and trailers occupying land in Brightlingsea were being moved on. And the tip I got was that they were going to come alongside me in Point Clear Bay. Now, where I am is all in land where most of the open spaces are owned by the Orchards Holiday Park. So I went down and saw the Orchards Management to tell them that within 24 hours expect some sort of incursions. Um, they said to me, they very seldom come onto our land, but as a company, Haven Holidays employ a firm to deal with this, and I'll pick that up, Michael, and we'll have it dealt with. But the reason why they don't come to us is that very many of the people illegally occupying land in that way know that if they do it on local authority land, the local authority is going to have to go through the legal process of serving this not notice, giving them time to move, in the end perhaps ultimately ending up at a magistrate's court where before the hearing they all disappear. He said they don't do that with us. We're supposed to follow exactly the same aspects of law. But our team seemed to deal with them in a different way. That evening, about 11 o'clock, their team arrived and they spoke to the six caravans that were on the land two or three doors up from my house. At 8 o'clock in the morning, they all moved. Now, don't ask me what the difference is. Don't ask me, I don't know, whether any threats were issued or what was issued. But the orchard's attitude was, and, um, you know, I'll paraphrase it, that we're obliged to abide by the same laws as you do. Councillor but Tom, if they think we're not doing it, let them sue us. And quite frankly, I don't want to be known by anybody. Thank you. Councillor Steady. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my understanding is there's already legislation under the uh, Public Order Act, Section 61, I think, where the police can actually request the people who are there illegally to remove themselves within, I believe, it's something like 24 hours. So the legislation is already there. It's just a case of using the legislation and not being afraid not to use it. Thank you. Councillor Stock. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, obviously an interesting subject, this. A lot of people have spoken on it. I support the motion. I think, I think Paul's absolutely right. We need to get uh, clearer powers because and the point Graham Steady Council Steady just made uh, I have heard that said before but <clears throat> I know some councils take the view that you can do that and the police and crime commissioner seems to take a different view and it does come down to, to policing, operational policing decisions as to what the police can do. We have heard about criminality taking place, that surely is, is a basic policing thing uh, what we're talking about here is, is, is not the, the criminality aspect but the, the trespassing on, on council owned land and the difficulties we have with the current powers that we've got and the rules and loopholes we have to jump through to get uh, illegal incursions and illegal encampments removed uh, following the law. So if that law could be <clears throat> uh, modified a bit so we could have a much more speedy process, I think the need for physical barriers would go. As anyways, we've heard, and I remember down at Holland Haven when we used to get some illegal incursions down there, there were steel gates that were concreted in there that just disappeared overnight. And a, a JCB or some other bit of heavy plant had obviously been down there and just whoosh, whipped them out. And, and no one even knows how they went. But it almost makes it more appealing, I think, putting physical barriers up. That's the danger we've got. We need the powers to remove illegal encampments, whoever it is doing it, whatever the illegal, you know, if someone's parked in one of our car parks illegally, then uh, they need to suffer the, the full weight of the law rapidly, just like anyone else would. And it needs to, <clears throat> it needs to be 
exactly the same rules applying to everyone, basically, and that's what's important. So I support the motion, and um, I'll write to, if that goes through, I'll, I will write to the MP and see what we can do. Mrs White, would you like to take a seat back in the audience? Thank you. Councillor Honeywood. Thank you, Chairman. Firstly, I'd like to say how pleased I am to hear the words of support for this idea. Um, I'd like to respond to a couple of the points that were raised. Um, it was mentioned about um, Section 61 powers. My colleague here is right. The police do have the right to use Section 61 powers. But they can only be used in very specific circumstances. Um, the police are have an officer attached to the traveller unit that, that works uh, on our behalf. But the, ex the circumstances have to be ex exceptional. And it's not within our power to invoke those, only the police. And I I've only known it happen on the odd occasion. Um, there was speak about we, we have the you know, um, rules that can do it. Did you know that the rules that we have to work to are different to the rules of private landowners? A, plan, a private landowner can move much more quickly and effectively than we can. I think it would be nice to give us a little bit more um, so that we can respond in that way. Um, one of the things that's been spoken about is where does this fly tipping come from? Can we catch the culprits? As a council, the options available to us to catch the fly tippers are quite restrictive. There are specific rules on such things as surveillance that we can't do. It all needs to be looked at. We need to be in a position where people who are from whatever background, area, I break the law, we need to be able to react and deal with it. So thank you for that. I'd like to finish on one last point, and I think we'll be knocking at an open door when we send this letter. I just happened to, to be flicking through some newspaper cuttings, because obviously uh, the issues of travellers and that come up as I have responsibility for it. A local MP um, in the Clacton Gazette on the August the 4th is quoted as saying, I want to make sure I can do everything to help. So I think we're now calling on his offer of help, um, and I sure will support him in <laughs> delivering the change I think we need for our local residents, um, and thank you. Right, we're going to go to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried. Is there anybody against? Councillor Butte, one. Thank you. Item 10. Questions pertinent to Council Procedure Rule 10.1. There are none. 11. Um, sorry. Is on pages... 31 and 32. Councillor Parsons. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, in regard to the four beech trees to be filled in the vicinity of Albert Gardens, would the portfolio holder for the environmental services please confirm that all costs are being met by Essex County Council and that there are, there are no costs to Tendron District Council. Will he also please advise the Council as to which authority is responsible for carrying out inspections on such trees in order to ensure that they are safe and healthy? Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question, Councillor Parsons. I didn't know the answers to these questions myself, to be perfectly honest, and therefore it's interesting in that way. The officers have prepared a report for me which I will read. The Council has a long-standing working arrangement with Essex County Council, which includes a substantial payment from them to this Council each year. This payment is included in the annual budgets for open spaces and horticultural services. The work includes highway verge and shrub maintenance and tree work. 
The four beech trees in the vicinity of Albert Gardens are the responsibility of Essex County Council and all costs relating to them will be met by them from the budget supplied to TDC as per the ongoing arrangement. In respect of your second question, responsibility for inspecting trees on the highway is Essex County Council's responsibility. However, the budget supplied by the Essex County Council covers dead, dying and dangerous trees. If any of these instances are brought to the attention of TDC, we will look to take the necessary action to minimise risk or danger to the public. Officers from TDC are in regular contact with Essex County Council to discuss any high value work or contentious issues of this sort. Thank you. Thank you. Item 12, report of the Leader of the Council. No report. 13, minutes of committees. The Council will receive the minutes of the following committees. Councillor Stop. Uh, Madam Chairman, I'll move those five sets of minutes on block, if that's all right. Everybody agree? Thank you. 14, motions to Council. There is none. 15, recommendations from the Cabinet. None. 16, reports submitted to the Council by the overall overview and scrutiny committee. There are none. 17, report of the Chief Executive. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I refor formally report that on December the 15th, 2016, Councillor Tom Howard resigned as a member of Tendering District Council. Notice of the vacancy in the Great and Little Oakley Ward has been given and requests to fill the vacancy have been received. The by-election will be held on Thursday, the 9th of February, 2017. Thank you, Madam Chairman. A team report of the Chief Executive, Membership of Committees. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, it is as, as written for information as attached on uh, page 59. Thank you. Oh, I apologise. And the supplementary report, which is contained on the, on the tables. Thank you. Nineteen, report of the Chief Executive review of the allocation of seats to political groups. Madam Chairman, just reports in terms of on page 61, um, in terms of the, 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 the um, following the decision of the Councillor Brown to leave the UKIP group, the decision of Councillor Parsons to leave the UKIP group and to join Labour group, and the resignation from the council, from the council of former Councillor Howard. And in accordance with the sections as detailed in the paper, um, there is a recommendation before you which is required to be moved by a member and seconded. Thank you. <coughs> oh, and there is a, an amended version also on the table. Thank you. Councillor Stop. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This is obviously a bit confusing. I'm just finding the right page here. Um, so the motion is, as on page 61, recommended that in accordance with the wishes of group leaders, Council approves the schedule of members that it is proposed should serve on each of the Council's committees and subcommittees, which is subject to the rules. Um, and obviously we're working to the uh, amended or the revised sheets in front of us. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd just like to say that the UK group does not agree with this Whittacombe, but considering recent circumstances, recent circumstances have decided that in order to maintain the smooth running of the Council and in view of the fact that the, another Whittacombe will be due at the full Council in March, we will vote in favour. We will, however, like our concern minuted and hope this will enable officers to address our concerns ahead of the full Council in March. Thank you. Councillor Stop. If I may just quickly come back on that, I appreciate um, Councillor Simpson's comments and what he's saying. There was a specific issue in respect of uh, a seat on the Corporate Management Committee, and I'm quite happy to do a swap with Councillor Stevenson and, and, and Ian Ford as, as advisement on how we can do that. 
outside of this meeting. It's not something we have to agree here and now. Uh, and I'm more than happy to do that. Um, and um, as you say, I, you, hopefully your concerns can be looked at in the meantime. But we'll get this agreed tonight. Thank you. All those in favour? That's agreed. Is there anybody against? Thank you. Item, item 20, report of the management and members support manager, electoral review of tendering. It's on pages 65 to 72. Councillor Honeywood. Thank you, Chairman. Um, obviously, you'll be aware that there has been a, a slight amendment amendment that has been circulated, which is uh, merely a changing of wording on one of the proposed wards. So uh, with that in mind, I would like to move the recommendation as written in on the recently circulated amendment. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bray, second. Councillor Bray. I uh, second that. Sure. Okay. Councillor Buke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Members will recall that I have spoken and voted against uh, the, these proposals at a previous meeting. Uh, and I will um, come back on a, a couple of things after reading to you a, an email which, which I uh, wrote to the Council on the 17th of January. Uh, and it says, I must first reiterate my previous view and comment that the Review Working Party does not fully constitute cross-party representation from the Council. It represents some of the main parties within TDC, but not smaller groups and independents. I must also repeat my oft-mentioned disappointment that Clacton does not have a town or parish council. Here at last is an opportunity to create and implement localism uh, in the biggest town within Tendring and ensure that Clacton residents achieve and reinstate appropriate representation since it lost its own council in 1974. This would amount to a disgraceful waste of opportunity flying in the face of localism and devolution. As far as the Frinton and Walton ward of my own, that's Holland and Kirby, the, the paragraph in the report says, there is not a community link between Great Holland and Kirby Lissoken. And, I quote, it was felt, it doesn't, doesn't say who felt it, but it was felt, that Great Holland would be best served by remaining in a rural-focused ward rather than being aligned to a more urban area. Who consulted with whom to establish these principles and opinions? Where was localism applied in this misunderstanding and misrepresentation of the facts and feelings between Great Holland and Kirby Open? These two villages are served by the same vicar or rector and their respective parochial church councils, and these are strong links consistent with the historic grouping with Kirby Cross, Frinton and Walton. Great Holland residents have a very strong link with Frinton as their nearest town and constantly drive through Kirby Cross as their main route to the towns and the coast. It's also worth mentioning that Frinton Golf Club uh, course uh, does lie within the parish, parish boundary of Great Holland. So I strongly object to these proposals and I just want to add one or two other things. And that is that the, the, the populations of uh, Great Holland, Kirby Lissoken and Kirby Cross at the moment total... Councillor Buke, sorry, can I get you to sum up? Your yep. time's up. Total 3,941. The forecast figures uh, within this report are 3,919. So we're forecasting a, a, a drop of 22 in the population of those three communities, in spite of having 400 dwellings approved uh, with planning applications uh, currently uh, agreed but not built. So why are we going to build 400 houses but have a population uh, loss of 22? I, I cannot believe that. So with those uh, figures in mind and my previous comments, I shall vote against the proposals. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Councillor Honeywood. Thank you, Chairman. Firstly, I'm somewhat surprised to hear Councillor Buke say um, there wasn't a chance for smaller groups um, to not be represented. Uh, the working group that looked at this has tried to make every opportunity for everyone to engage. Um, yes, there were groups that looked at um, the boundaries and processes, but they were very mindful of small groups, they were mindful of independence. That's why the offer was made 
for everyone, irrespective of being a group member or not a group member, to meet with the officer one-to-one, -one, in private if they wished, to discuss their concerns. At the final stages, it was at the request of the working group that an email be sent to say that if you wanted to make any changes or you had any concerns, contact the officer before this meeting. I'm not aware of that um, happening. The other point raised, Clacton Town Council. Well, that's an issue for Clacton residents. It's for them to decide if they want a town council or not. Um, what's interesting, I think, from Councillor Buke's point is if they had a town council, they wouldn't be able to actually vote for who sat on it. Um, but it is for Clacton residents to decide if they want a town council, and I think that's a decision we should leave with them. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Scott. Yeah, um, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I also had a lovely meeting with, with Karen, and uh, I have to say, um, the officers have done a really good job on this. It's, it's, it's really is tricky to draw out boundaries to please people, ward councillors, residents, spitting up housing estates, may not have spit up housing estates, not sure whether your community is linked with that community or not. For me, Oxford and Thorington, are less than a mile apart, and, and uh, Karen has acknowledged that, and other officers that deal, have looked at the wards, looked at the maps, looked at communities that are linked to other communities. I was like dreading the, 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 the silly situation they've got in Colchester Borough, where you have a rural north ward, we have 11 parish councils where ward councillors, just imagine a situation you had one independent, one UKIP and one Conservative councillor who was elected in, in rural North Ward, and they don't get on those three councillors, that all of them have got to go to the 11 parish councils. It's absolutely silly that, that wards like that have been cut up in Colchester. In Tendring, however, it is encouraging that some of the wards have been carefully done. And I, and I, and I, I would like to thank the officer, Karen, Ian and, and and we do wheel out also uh, um, Ken Brown every so often to assist. Uh, <laughs> when, I had pri when, I, when I had a private meeting with uh, Car uh, Karen and um, Ken Brown was there, I said, oh, you, you're blasting past, come back again. And um, we had a nice chat, and, um, and the boundaries, in my view, have been carefully done with care and attention. Some wards will go up. Like, uh, with the, you have to consider the, the, the garden settlement, the west of the district, time that happens, there'll be another ward with you, I suspect. Um, and there'll be uh, areas... Sorry, I've got two councillors there talking to themselves, and I'm trying to uh, pay attention and speak. Would you mind yeah. paying attention, please? <laughs> <laughs> As I was saying, it's so important that these wards that are actually are looked at by individuals and residents, but Councillor Butte mentioned about a town council. I do support a Clapton town council. People don't realise that parish and town councils can look for funding. My parish council in Oxford, they go for grants here, there and everywhere. Okay, Councillor Scott, can I ask you to finish, please? Yep, I'm just saying that don't write off a Clapton town council because they can go and get funding. And that may benefit people in Clapton. So just put, bear that in mind. Thank you. Councillor Parsons. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I wasn't really planning to speak on this tonight, but, you know, I like the sound of my own voice, so <laughs> what the heck. Um, for anyone that's not aware, spreadsheets, statistics, any kind of data-related um, information is a bit of a guilty pleasure of mine. Um, and, and certainly the officer, Karen Neath, was well aware of that when I called her about three times in one day saying, have you got the information on this particular figure and everything like that. But it became very, quick, uh, very apparent very early on um, in, in kind of looking behind the stats and the figures that an enormous amount of work has gone into to putting this together. And I just think that um, all of the officers, all of the staff, all of the councillors that are involved in putting this to together should be greatly applauded because it's no mean feat. And, and obviously, you know, this is one of those things where some people are going to be happy, some people aren't. And that's, that's unfortunately just the rub, uh, unfortunately. Um, 
With respect to uh, Clacton having a town council, I think it is a very important debate, very interesting debate, and one that we should have, but we shouldn't have it now. We shouldn't have it as part of this electoral review. Um, the LGBCE are duty-bound to deal with what they've got in front of them, um, so why on earth would they start putting pieces of puzzle in that, that aren't there? But I agree that it is something that we we should discuss and, and allow the residents to, to vote on. But I'll be in support of it. Thank you. Councillor Watt, then. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that um, we had some issues over the uh, division of Frinton and the way things are changing there. And Councillor Turner and I uh, sat down and did a lot of work. Well, Councillor Turner did a tremendous amount of work. And we went and we presented it uh, to Karen Neath and, and the rest of the gang. And they were brilliant. They, they, they looked at what we'd taken. They, they took us seriously. Um, and we ended up with, um, with, we, we ended up with, a, with, with, a, with a great result. Um, and I'd like to say to Councillor Buke, uh, I hadn't noticed, it's my fault because I was looking elsewhere, I hadn't noticed that um, the actual golf course is in the, uh, is, is in, in the Great Holland uh, Ward, which um, I'm sure the residents of the golf course will be extremely concerned. But um, I, 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 frankly, I don't think it makes much difference. But I, I think it's, 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 well, it's come out well. Uh, it was going to be contentious. And we all had an opportunity, and I think the officers did a brilliant job. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Chair. Um, as some of you might know, I actually also sat on this working party. Uh, and I would just also like to thank the officers and uh, Councillor Honeywood for his chairing. It was very free and open. Obviously, at the beginning, I disagreed with the 48, and that's still my stance. But we are where we are. And when I came with possible solutions to potential problems with the wards and everything else, Ken Brown, Karen Neef, Ian, Ford, they were all very receptive along with the rest of the committee. I put forward uh, 12 solutions to, to 12 problems uh, and they turned down two. One of them was when I decided to try and rename Frinton Upper and Lower Frinton. <laughs> Councillor Bray, you're the seconder, then after that we're going to the vote. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I think it's pretty much all been said. Um, I joined the uh, working party right at the end, so I can claim no responsibility for any of the hard work done, and nor would I try. Um, I think the officers have done a fantastic job. Many of us were never in favour of reducing from 60 to 48, but we had to. It made the job very, very difficult for officers and everybody involved. But I think they've done the best they possibly could with this. Um, I think it's really good. Um, thank you, everybody. All those in favour? Is there anybody against? Two. Three. Three. Thank you, that's carried. Nothing coming. Urgent matters for debate, there are none. And the date of the next meeting is Tuesday the 7th of February. I declare the meeting closed. Please be upstanding. <laughs>